Hello again, thank you for being back. Um, we're gonna continue with our program with our second conversation of the day. Um, it's entitled, Words, 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 How Conspiracy Theories, Polarized Talk Show Rhetorics and Social Media Activities Distort Our Perception of Reality and How Well-Reputed Media Could React. Um, we're very happy to welcome our moderator for this panel, Beppe Severnini. Um, <laughs> Renowned author from Italy, um, and we're going to have as our two panelists Sonja Seymour Mikic, um, editor in chief of VDR German Television, <laughs> and Lukas Warschecha, journalist and author from Poland, who's in the audience, I was told, and coming out from there, yes. <laughs> And of course, our students who are going to participate in this panel, and I think they're coming from behind and from beyond and from the back. Please, join us. Off we go. Where is the boss? Sasha? It's on? Shall we go? Okay. Good morning, everyone. The extra chair, it, because I, I noticed there was a Polish student. She, she was in a previous panel, but I need a Polish fact checker, so I invite her on. <laughs> okay, let's see how, uh, I, I tell you how I want to proceed. Uh, the only nice, the good things about being the moderator is that you're not very important at all. You'll see that the students and my two guests are much more interesting than I am, but I am the boss. So I decide how to go about this. I don't speak, I won't speak very much. I'll tell you how I would like to do two minutes introduction by me, literally two minutes. Then I have one question for Sonia and one question to Lukas, myself, and then I'll shut up. And, this, and the students will ask wherever they want, short questions, not speeches, not the lectures. You're too young. Wait, when you are old, my age, you can go on, but now, no. Uh, the answer will be as short, so we have many so topics. When you, when you speak, please introduce yourself, say who you are, where you come from, and where do you study, which will help everyone to understand. Okay, then uh, uh, the introduction in, is pretty simple. Is um, Look what I found here. That's Time Magazine, 1996. 50 years. Happiness, Europe, optimism. 50 remarkable years. A celebration of past, present, and future. The problem with the future, it actually happens. So 2016 is not 2000 and, and 1996. I'll read you the summary from Time Magazine special supplement on Europe in 1996. 50 remarkable years, out of the ashes, the idea of unity, finding a middle way, the walls come down. The Berlin Wall just a few years before had gone down. Forg forging union and beyond, lovely optimism, excitement. Now, that's the introduction to today's conference. Populism, extremism, Euroscepticism are haunting Europe, creating a tense atmosphere in which fear, hate, anger, and anxiety genera generate a climate of European angst. I love 
Goethe Institute and the Germans, because they don't mince words. In 20 words, 10 are pretty worrying words. I met populist, extremist, euroscepticism, tense, fear, hate, anger, anxiety, and angst again. Just, okay, that's where we are. But that ex this is not scaremongering. That's where we are. It's a very difficult time for Europe, and I think it's only right to see whether the way we use the social media. I have almost a million followers on, on Twitter. I decided that when I reach one million, I go from journalist to rock star. Uh, and every time I go on television, Every time I say something, I write in the New York Times, where I work, or where I write, and, New and Corriere della Sera, but especially television. I, like last night, I was on Italian Prime 10 television, hundreds of really violent messages, you know, threatened, insults. Is that freedom of expression? I be, I've been following. That's a question we have to ask. Not about me. It's, about every, it ha it's happening to everyone. Television. Television audience is good when people clash. And then all news website, they love to have the little clip where the two they clash and they have one minute. Look how exciting it was. So you, all this is happening and we don't know where it's leading. So my first question is, uh, so my introduction is over and my first question is for you, Lukas. From last night, I follow you on Twitter. I hope many people did. And then also we have a couple of common friends in Poland. I'll tell you about that later. Uh, you say, okay, I quote you. Lukas Wacheka, 54,341 followers, one is me. Uh, you, you were talking yesterday about this conference, and your tweet says something interesting. It, most of them are in Polish, and uh, unless I ask uh, help, I won't be able to understand, but a few are in English. And one, you pose a very interesting question, uh, in fact. And, is it, and you say, if populism were defined, it could be no longer be used as an easy instrument to bash whoever they want. First, who are they? And second, what is populism? Well, they, I think, am, I, am I hurt? Yes. Um, they, I think it is quite obvious. I meant people who were on the stage yesterday, because yesterday's discussion was absolutely one-sided and quite disappointing. Today is a different matter. Um, and the second question, sorry, was? Uh, there is a middle question. Why was it disappointing? I wasn't here. Why was it disappointing? For many reasons. And in fact, I wrote them down, but if I were to enlist all of them, it would take probably two hours or three. So I will just tell Don't. you. So, yes, so I will just tell you that first reason for me why it was disappointing was exactly the first part of my tweet that you have just quoted, which was. All the time, and even today, I've been hearing the word populism, xenophobia, and so on and so on. But I have never heard any definition of these words. What uh, is populism? You always say populism is dangerous, populism is spreading, and so on and so on. Okay, xenophobia. What is populism? Because I would say... No, that, that, that won't... I would no, no, say... No, no, no. That, I ask you. You don't but, ask me. No, I am not asking you. I, I'm, I'm saying what I would say. I would say that populism is where you bash everyone you don't like with the word populism. This is populism. Okay. Okay. Um, I would like to give a different different definition. For me, populism is definitely anti-elitist, anti-establishment. And from there, we have to start to differ. There is a sense of people, the people, as an entity unquestionable. 
not varied and populist movements say we know what the people the people feel we have no time for the others what the people feel we are the uh, we give the interpretations of what people feel and um, we exclude everything else what i find uh, very strongly in right-wing populism is this sense of the people as an almost metaphysical entity what I find with left-wing populism is the questioning of economic, of economic givens, that's stronger there. Um, what I also disagree with very often, populist is indeed used in an inflationary way. Sometimes things are simply popular, full stop. Sometimes politicians make suggestions which are popular but not necessarily populist. But why is populism dangerous? I think it's not the question of them questioning the status quo. That's always very healthy. To question the status quo is healthy. But to then proceed to uh, what? To negate rule of law, the boring parliamentarian process, how to change things, going um, um, building parties with a program, suggesting solutions and so on. That is where populists, in my mind, fail. This is, sorry, but this is a very imprecise definition. You say that populism is anti-elitist. Is there anything wrong with being anti-elitist if the elites are wrong? I've, I mean, I've been watching this conference uh, for just for a couple of hours from yesterday. And I have an impression that if there is any angst, this angst is inside many people here in this hall, and perhaps even inside you. And this is the angst and anxiety that the reality has been slipping out of your hands. Because you don't control it anymore. And if you say that populism is seeking for some very easy solutions, I would ask you, how many undemocratic processes in Europe can you see now? How many undemocratic processes? If you look at Hungary, democratic elections. If you look at Poland, democratic elections. The majority of people have chosen their leaders. And of course, in Poland too, we have a part of the elite, at least a part of the elite, who is frightened because they are no longer the owners of what's been going on. And this is the same thing here in Europe, in Western Europe, and in the USA. Is this populism? No. This is the choice of the majority. This is democracy, not populism. I think so. Actually, I, no, actually, in the second. USA. No, 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 so, no, no. No, I am the boss. You, you have the boss in yeah, your program. I'm the boss here. Okay. Uh, she's thinking, we are on television. People are arguing the way. It, it, it already spread to Bozar and to Brussels. But I'm a boss and I'm a kind boss. So please go ahead. Well, for one, you're, you're saying you to me, and I don't quite know, are you talking about the Germans? Are you talking about me individually? Are you talking about me as a television journalist? Are you talking about me as a representative of public television, I would claim, at its best? That's one question. I'm definitely not elitist. That's rubbish. Um, my background is definitely not elitist, but I studied. What does that make me? Elite? Or does that make me an educated person? person who can articulate herself. I hope it is the latter. Um, elites, again, there are elites which control power, which control money, um, and there's very, it's healthy, I said before, it's healthy to question this. That's what people do. That's what movements do. That's one thing. Anti-establishment is healthy, I said before. It is healthy to question the status quo, but not in a sense that, okay, this is all threatening to the good people who are down and out and to portray a picture of people as the last refuge of truth, honesty, authenticity. Uh, I don't agree to that. I find that very arrogant. Um, and you say, okay, Polish people have voted in their government. I hope they will vote them out again. Um, same with Trump. The American people, by the way, Mrs. Clinton, who I dislike immensely, but still, 
she had 2.7 million voters more than Mr. Trump. So it's the, legal, it's the electoral system. It is not exactly a mirror image of democracy that happened there. Um, what else? Hungary, we will see. In Poland, I also have Polish friends who take to the streets if they dislike things happening. So all is in order. Um, what I dislike about populists in government is the them and us thing. I believe very much in we, including, and it is a successive process. It is, um, if you look back in history, it was very good that Paul Schaeffer and others mentioned history, by the way. If you look back in history, all men are equal. It meant men. It meant owners. It didn't mean the slaves. It didn't mean the blacks. It didn't mean women. It didn't mean uh, poor people. And then gradually, 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 it all added up to a we until even nowadays, including lesbians, gays, uh, and so on. You know what I mean. So this inclusion to a larger we is something I do not find in populist governments or movements, and that is why I disagree. And that is why I would probably argue against them or fight against them, whatever is necessary. I'm sorry, uh, just one second, one second, one second. No, no it's not, a, no, honestly, it's not, it's very interesting. It's a great horse d'oeuvre. I like this but it's not a debate, we have to involve them. But first, a quick question. She said, if you go back in history, don't you think that if we look back in history, in my country's history, in Sonia's country's history, in your country's history, in Europe's history, some of that aggressive populist, you know, we are the people against the elite, turn, in something, turn into something extremely unpleasant eight years ago? Uh, yes, we know that very well because we were attacked by two totalitarisms in 1939, German one and Russian one. So we know that very well, of course. We didn't have one in Poland, apart from the communist one. Okay, you know, it just uh, rem history is a good guide and all the time and we have to remember that. Now, uh, can be questions, can be short opinion, they don't have to end with a question mark, so whoever wants to start, Feel free, uh, you have your microphone, do you, don't you? You do not have a microphone, good. I'll, I will, okay, you have mine, we'll, sh oh, no. okay, we'll share one. Uh, you wanna start? Okay, your name? So my name is Jay, uh, I come from Spain, and I studied at the UNED, which is a distance education university, I studied law. Um, we're talking about history. I wanted to talk about a historian, uh, an American writer called John Green. He makes YouTube videos about um, different um, historic moments, and he explains what, what happened in, in that era. What's his name? John Green, American writer. And in those videos, he always has his laptop. And on the laptop, it says, this machine kills fascists. And I looked into it, and obviously, by this machine, he meant the internet, and he meant independent media, and the fact that we can, through the internet, access any sources of, uh, of uh, information. So I wanted to ask you if you think that independent media kills fascism. Sonia? Um, yes and no. The internet was a great promise, a promise to give equal access to everyone in the world to information to make up their own mind, to get, um, to get to information that has been withheld from them. Um, and I was an enthusiastic surfer when, when it sort of started a long time ago. Um, now I'm not so sure. Uh, the internet, as you all know, is full of um, filter bubbles, full of echo chambers where you talk to yourself, basically, to those who are like-minded. So is that good if you are not exposed to other views? That's why I like sitting here with Lukash, because I'm exposed to very, very different views. Um, so uh, with regards to the internet, I, I'm, I'm not a great um, enthusiast anymore. Now, with regards to independent media, online or offline, yes, I have a great, great admiration for many of them. 
Um, we know about, obviously, about Laura Poitras, we know uh, about Green World, um, about all these new journalist corporations which try to convey um, information beyond that what we, the, the um, mainstream, I don't like the word, but anyway, the mainstream media can possibly do. Great researchers and so on. Yes, I agree. Um, I want that to happen. I hope they can find fundraising and so on, and they can carry on the good work. Sometimes I don't agree with the good work, but that's a different matter. A follow-up question for you on the internet. I appreciate you have very strong opinion, but you come here with a name and a surname, Lukas Bajeka. Uh, don't you think that some of that people on the web, uh, the, the hide behind nicknames, anonymity, and that's becoming a real problem? Because don't we are going to read it again, what we're going to talk about today here is not populism on politics or government, but the media. And the title we've chosen is How Conspiracy Theories Polarize Talk Show Rhetorics and Social Media Activity Distort Our Perception of Reality. Uh, it's a very specific question. It's about anonymity. Do you like that? Do you think it's, a, it's an improvement in public debate or is that a threat? To, our, to the level of, of our public discourse. First of all, I would like to very briefly refer to the question, because I hate discussing things that are not defined. I would ask you, how do you define fascism in contemporary Europe, uh, and where can you find any counting fascist forces, any fascist forces that can really change reality in Europe? This would be my question to you because I don't know what you want to fight with. And uh, answering your question, I'm absolutely for anonymity on the internet, against oh. any for, any, against any censorship, including so-called hate speech. I see censorship based on the notion of hate speech as a way to silence people who are um, uncomfortable for the elites. And I myself can tell you that really quite often, or even every day, uh, I'm bashed by haters, I hate this word, but I will use it, by haters on the internet, because I'm very, I was very critical about the previous Polish government, I'm very critical about the current Polish government, I'm very critical about the left, and I'm bashed, I've been bashed all the time. And this is what is the role and the fate of a public person. I'm prepared to take it. We need another microphone, uh, definitely. If you can find another microphone. Uh, just one second. I interviewed my Prime Minister, Matteo Renzi, in July. The day I went at Corriere della Sera in the morning, a gentleman who, whose name is, was Marco Tullio Traiano, some Roman name, a nickname, said, this afternoon, we're going to blow you up. Is that freedom of expression? I'm asking. Because that's exactly what happened. I reported this to, pol to the police, of course. Then, of course, he said, oh, I was joking. Okay, are you, were you joking? People that told the, 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 the head of the Italian lower chamber of communists, she's a woman, Laura Boldrini, that should be raped by animals or something like that, strings of those tweets and come Facebook comment. Is that freedom of expression? Should be allowed that to go on like that? Sorry about this, and then I'll, I promise I'll be quieter, but this is very important to me. Is that okay? If you speak about very concrete and precise threats, they are usually contained in the law. And in Poland it would be the same thing. If someone threatens you, like I will kill you, or I will strangle you, or something like that, you can take it, you can go to the police, you can show it to the police, and uh, he should be at least uh, taken to the police station and uh, questioned. That is quite obvious, but what is hate speech? How do you define hate speech? If you want to base your censorship of, or, or on the notion of hate speech, what would be a hate speech? If I call a Negro a Negro, would it be a hate speech? In Poland, we use the word muzin, which means exactly Negro. It's not offensive, but some people would like to ban it because they think it is a hate speech, uh, an example of hate speech. I don't think so. 
This is very, very vague. We mustn't base any laws of censorship on vague notions. It's not vague. You have criminal law in Poland. We have in Italy. They have in Germany. Uh, I cannot go out in the street or in a bar and, and insult people and offend people. I don't see why I should be allowed to, be, to do that and more on the Internet, which actually has got the potential to go farther. Sorry about this. It was an interlude. Uh, your question first. Your name? Uh, do you listen to me? Yes. My name is Ermelinda Jeza. I am Greek Albanian and I'm doing a PhD at the University of Amsterdam. So I have a small uh, comment to Lukas. Uh, I have to say, like, it is democracy, but democracy is, has a paradox. Democracy requires educated citizens and democratic citizens. So maybe we failed to construct democratic citizens, and that's our problem now. So now my question is to Sonia. And my favorite philosopher, Judith Butler, says that affect is never only our own. It's co always communicated from elsewhere. So because I'm working on the refugee crisis, I would like to know like, how you um, uh, expect like, um, democracy, ethical responsibility toward the refugee, how you see like, your own responsibility as someone who communicates this feeling of understanding our communities in open up space to reimagine them, which includes more of us. Like how you see the role of the media in this? Um, do you see the power of the media or you see like you cannot affect them? Like how you deal with this in your everyday work and how many journalists can even uh, transgress the fact that they're always um, a product of ideology themselves? Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, we live in a sense of ambiguity at the moment, the media. I would actually say many many journalists. Let me talk about journalists rather than media. Journalists, people who want to, uh, want to convey information or opinions. Um, this ambiguity leads to the fact that you will have in one broadcasting company very different views on uh, migration policies, for example. In my company you will have um, talk shows which with, uh, with representatives of populist parties, by the way, um, who will say, this is all rubbish, Merkel was wrong, this is impossible, rapists are coming, and so on. You will have, in the same company, um, online talk shows, um, comments, um, Facebook Live, which show great empathy for individual refugees. You will have foreign news reporting, reporting from Greece, for example, the situation in Lesbos and so on. Very close, very real um, descriptions of the situation. So, um, yes, the media has power, but only so far. And it should only have so far power because we're not elected. We are not elected. Um, our job is to, to show exactly what is happening with good wording. By the way, this morning I heard, I heard quite interesting, um, government, uh, Assad's government troops have taken control of Aleppo. In Mosul, it is the Allied forces have liberated Mosul. Yeah, very interesting wording. So that is something journalists have to take care of when they talk about these mega issues. Wording is one thing. Um, make your standpoint clear. I am reporting this section of reality, which I can witness. I don't know what's happening there. I've had that, I was a war reporter for a long time. I could only say this is happening here, in Russia, Chechnya, and so on. I don't know what's happening 50 kilometers on. So you have to make that clear. You have to make your work transparent. You are not there to follow a mission as a journalist, not necessary, but you, can, uh, you, can, uh, you cannot allow your beliefs um, to be totally behind. That's not possible. You're a human being with a certain sense of what is decent, indecent, what is um, achievable, not achievable. So again, a long answer to an excellent <laughs> and long question. It is ambiguous and what we have to learn we, the journalists, but also you, our users, our audiences, is to actually handle ambiguity. It's not difficult, you know. Uh, one person can be a vegetarian, um, uh, a devout Catholic, 
um, um, a well-traveled student, um, homosexual, all at the same time. You have to tolerate ambiguity, different identities. Um, and if we can teach that that is possible with our products, with our media products, fine. Short comment referring to your, I don't know, comment or question. You said, if I understood well, that perhaps citizens are not democratic enough to participate in the democratic process. So I would like to ask you, who, yes, who is supposed to decide whether they are mature enough to participate? I never approach people as um, they are not. People are always becoming something. So what is, like, what we become. I don't think people are ignorant. They are very capable of understanding. What they lack is the power of changing things, and they are affected because they are, have anxieties and concerns. And this is why I say that it's a paradox, because we have to construct democracy and democratic citizens. It is a result of democracy, but we did something wrong. But this is not the, the answer to my question. My question was very simple. Who is going to decide when exactly citizens are mature enough to participate in democratic process because I have an impression that if you don't like the result of the democratic process like in the USA or perhaps in Hungary you will say they are not mature enough if they choose who you like yes they are mature I didn't say they are not mature I think that we have to understand why we are here now and there are much more important questions to, to make instead of labeling maturity I have a question for uh, Yen. I have a question for Yen. Uh, from, uh, she's from Vietnam. And the, question, and the same question to Zera, and she's from Turkey. Is there anything that you, that you found in European Union coming here to study in terms of freedom of expression, the way we, that you like to bring back home? Well, I actually prepared a question. But, no, you um, answer mine first. Yeah. And it actually has something to do with your point. Because like, um, I was wondering whether the area of focus in the European media had anything to do with the, their European vested interests. Because, for example, we, the refugee crisis became a crisis when refugees enter Europe. But no one questions how countries like Turkey and Jordan and Lebanon, they hosted more than 4 million refugees. No one talk about, for example, the Rohingya uh, refugee crisis in Southeast Asia. So, yeah, this is my question. Uh, to whom? I mean, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, but first, would you like to answer very briefly what I, is anything that you see in the European Union that makes you say, wow, I like to bring this back in terms of the way we debate things and social and television or nothing you can learn in... Uh, I would like to, but it's not possible, so... What about you? Zera. And well, I, I don't see a lot of the things different. Like, we hold the same discussions in Turkey, so it's quite normal for me, and I don't think there's something different that I should bring back to my country. Okay. Uh, Please, Sonia, if you want to. Yeah, um, there's very often this what about question, yeah? Um, and there's even an English expression for it, and it's called what aboutism. So um, you have an argument, you answer, and then the person says, what about? That's what you did, fine. Um, what about the reasons why people um, flee their country? What about? Jordan and so on, who bear the brunt of the refugee crisis, no doubt about that. What about refugee crisis in Southeast Asia? These reports are there. And what I sometimes don't understand is, hey, users and viewers, why don't you use the internet um, efficiently and find in the uh, what we call media taking or whatever archives you will find all these things you will find 45 minute documentaries on what's going on in the near east you will not find them at prime time that's one of the great misgivings that i have prime time audiences prime time programming is different but you will find everything you can possibly want um, of quality television online and you will find even more if you go to the blogs if you go to youtube and so on it is all there what i also expect now 
I've learned my lesson, is um, that the audience itself educates itself to use the media yeah, and to find what they're looking for. Now, we talked about hate and hate uh, postings and so on. There's also another brand of postings I, I surely dislike, and that is what about the things you do not talk about, and that is, um, this is something I have to answer, by the way. Um, you did not cover, when you covered the US elections, you did not cover the fact that uh, Mrs. Clinton and Lady Gaga and Angela Merkel are members of a satanic cult who meet regularly and do outrageous things, right? So you laugh, you laugh. This is serious matter because I am obliged to answer. Why? Because our set of rules at my television company makes me answer absurd questions. And that is something that um, I, I don't want to tolerate anymore. I actually want to be able to refuse to answer stupid questions. And why? Because it consumes time. It consumes time um, for other things. And what I expect of you, the educated, enlightened audience, is when you see things like that on the internet, uh, don't just sort of laugh. Say, this is wrong. You know, this is wrong. There's a mistake there. Not I feel you are wrong, but this is wrong, and I can prove it. And that is what we have to do in the future. We have to disprove these assumptions. I, I sometimes say, look, if one person says the moon is made of cheese, and 99 Nobel Prize uh, laureates say, no, not really. You know, uh, we have, uh, we can actually say it is not made of cheese. Why would I have to contend with this one person and his conspiracy theory and his idiotic ideas about satanic cults and about the moon and so on? Um, very concrete, you say freedom of speech, we shouldn't censor that, fine, you shouldn't censor stupidity, but stupidity can actually enter real life as we had with Pizzagate, I don't know if you followed that. Pizzagate just happened very recently a pizza place in the States was somehow determined as a center of child sex abuse, pedophilia, whatever business. Somehow also linked to the Clintons, by the way. And a chap from North Carolina traveled, what, 400 miles or so to this pizza place with his gun, entered there because he wanted to liberate the children which were held there as slaves. Now, not only were the people who owned the place, the neighbors, hassled and threatened for weeks and weeks, yeah, because of alleged uh, pedophilia, but also this person actually wanted to hurt, to kill. That is where these hate mails, these conspiracy theories, take real consistence, and that is actually what I would very much like to censor. Uh, uh I know you want to answer this, so let me, I have a follow-up question to Sonia's. As you know, in Macedonia, for instance, there were a website that built fake news, completely fake news, completely invented, made a lot of traffic, and Google did something, so at least they stopped making money on the ads, but Facebook did nothing. Do you think, a follow-up question, that this, the big social media should be held responsible somehow, or freedom of expression is also, as Mark Zuckerberg say, Facebook is only a tech company, so we don't care about the content. Because what is happening in that kind of thing can affect election, can scare people. Can that, is that okay? So everything goes, even before a big election, because it's coming up, and it will be come up more. So if you answer both of us, because on this one, Sonia and I, I think, agree. Yeah, first of all, let me tell you, perhaps this is beginning quite boring, but I really want and like to be precise. So um, I marvel at Sonia, who is able to make a five-minute speech answering a completely imprecise question, like what about refugees in that or that country? What about, so what does that mean? What about, what, what should we answer? What is the question in fact? And you made, you have just made a five minute speech answering that, so really this is something to marvel at. And now answering your question, yes, I think that people are responsible for what they read and for what they do. I 
very strongly believe in personal responsibility. And I don't believe in censorship. And we have just had in Poland an affair with Facebook who started to censor patriotic profiles on, on Facebook. Um, and our minister for um, digital society had a conversation with the representatives of Facebook who promised to be more careful in the future. But I'm against any censorship and I'm sure that if companies like Facebook or Twitter start to censor um, posts and profiles, people will find some other places uh, in the digital, digital sphere to post their thoughts. And remember, everyone who does anything is responsible for what he does. If a man comes and kills anyone, he's responsible. Not those who published any, as you say, conspiracy theories and anything like that. This is personal responsibility for everyone's deeds. Including posting fake and dangerous news. Yes, that's right. Okay, your turn. Uh, hello, yeah, uh, my name is Piotr. I'm uh, Dutch and I study post-Soviet politics in uh, UCL in London. Uh, my question is probably more relevant to Sonia. Um, and is how can traditionally respected media outlets or mainstream media uh, stay relevant to a big audience in a post-truth world where facts and the opinion of experts don't really matter anymore? Um, and with the rise of news channels like Russia Today uh, on TV or on Sputnik uh, and Breitband online uh, that gain, gain more and more influence. And sort of as a follow-up to that question, uh, do you feel that mainstream media has failed to distance themselves over time from the establishment? Uh, and this is just a reaction to it. I think the latter is true. Um, I think there is too much cozying up to political groups. Doesn't matter which, doesn't matter which. Um, and uh, there's too often, you know, sort of background talks and parties where journalists and politicians mingle. I do not, arm's length. But that's a, a matter of principle and other colleagues do it differently for different reasons. So, yes, I think there's a danger of being too chummy, chummy. And uh, we saw in the States with the Iraqi war, uh, we saw what happened with the media. They All of a sudden, they all joined the same tune. And uh, with Europe, we sometimes have that as well. So, yes, there is a danger, but I also know that many colleagues are very conscious of this, so I have hope. Um, now, the first part of your question was, um, are we losing ground? I think that's what you mean. Um, and how to counterbalance. I, I believe in fact-checking, definitely. And one of the great dilemmas we are facing is that the audience, the users, want their news now. It's on Twitter, so I want it now. Where are these slow mainstream media? Why are they not there? Because we are actually fact-checking, right? So, so we are combining something, speed and quality, which is very difficult to combine. But fact-checking is important. And the second thing is, which also answers the second part of your question, we have to go out to the people. We have to actually know what is going on on the ground and not just sit in our offices and read tweets and postings. And by the way, I have, I have decided I've got an anonymous Facebook account, which I hardly use, because it's a waste of time for me, you know. And um, my Twitter account is sort of, I retweet other people's clever ideas and sometimes I post a photo. But I still receive hate mails in a great deal. And the answer to that is, with any person, take it to the police. Do not let it just sit, take it to the police. Well, it, this was a very um, good question about the separation of so-called reputable media from ordinary people. And now I will have uh, a terrible confession to make that I used to work for 10 years in the biggest Polish daily newspaper called Fact, which is based, and it still is the biggest Polish newspaper, based on the pattern of uh, German build. 
Um, and I still write for another tabloid newspaper. Now this is the second biggest uh, tabloid newspaper, newspaper in general, in Poland. And not only, I'm not ashamed of that, but I'm proud of that. Because I think these are the media that are really close to people and not so-called reputable highbrow media. And now, as far as highbrow media who do fact-checking, as you said, are concerned, let me remind you the story that Mr. Sheffer mentioned in the previous panel about the little boy washed on the beach. As you perhaps remember, first there was a heartbreaking picture and only then those reputable media found out that the father with the boy did not, had not traveled directly from Syria, but from Turkey, where they were not endangered. And by the way, the body of the boy was moved to the, exactly to the shore so that it looked better in the pictures. So for me, this is to sum up fact-checking in the reputable media. This is ridiculous. Uh, this makes no difference. The boy died. This makes great difference because they were not escaping the war. They were traveling to Europe for better economic conditions, not escaping direct danger. This is and great so, difference. This and, is great difference. And? And so the responsibility lies solely on the father and not, and not on anyone else. And what about Polish, uh, Polish workers working in England who are now at the receiving end of racism? It's their fault. Why did they go there? They're only looking for a better life. Don't compare. This was what Hertha Miller did yesterday. She compared refugees of 1956 from Hungary with economic refugees from alien cultures. This is incomparable, completely incomparable. And however strongly you denied it, however strongly you denied it, however strongly you denied, there is a big difference between people who move among countries within Europe and people who come from outside Europe, from other alien cultures. Okay, now, one, one second, because this is not... No, hold on a second, this is not going well. Some people deserve to die, that's the result. What I get is some people deserve to die. If it's economic, it's fine if, you, if they die. Yes. No responsibility. No, 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 now this no, is no. the no way you want no to ethics, discuss no problems. I hear exactly what when I participate in such discussions. This is exactly the same. Now you start. Now you start hearing from the audience at me because I'm uncomfortable incom here with you, and you are uncomfortable with me, and that is exactly what I expected to happen. Well. As far, as far as I know, you had the chance to say whatever you wanted, and uh, I didn't object to every single sentence. I listened to you as I'm listening to everyone. But I want them, please, try to remember we're talking about, remember what we're here to talk about, about the media, about conspiracy theory. It's, that's a panel. Don't bring back things from other panels, because otherwise it's going to never be over. Okay, so what is your question about? So now, I'm first answer me, How, what is your question about? It's about fake news. Good, and go ahead, I like that. <laughs> to bring it back to the topic. Uh, your uh, name? <laughs> I'm Eric, I'm a Swedish-American studying in Berlin. So my question is, we clearly have the right to say what we like on the internet, and you've clearly expressed that. But aside from saying, I say it because I can say it, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something, why spread the disinformation knowingly. Not accusing you, but why would one who's familiar with the topic? You want to answer that? I don't quite gather why you are asking me. I'm not spreading knowingly any disinformation. So you should ask p people who do that. But you're defending their right to. Yes, because they have the right to say whatever they want. But don't ask me why they do it. This is the question to them, not to me. Now, he's asking, is that a, a right? I mean, do people have a right to spread completely fake news, misinformation, some of which can be actually very dangerous? Not only because it affects election, which is, but because it affects the example of Washington and there are others. It affects people 
state of mind. It is difficult. You can bring people to, you know, there are crazy people around. If you, if you give them fu fuel, they can get a weapon and go into a place. They yes, but I and you say, oh, I'm sorry, too bad. I spread misinformation and these people are crazy around that. So you, because freedom of expression extends to whatever, threaten, defame, insult. That's all freedom of information. Answer me, please. The line lies with criminal code of every country. And now the question is what you include into the criminal code. In my opinion, this is a very dangerous situation and you should be very, very careful including any limits into the criminal code. Otherwise, people are responsible for their deeds personally, not the person who perhaps incited them to do anything, but the person who does the deed. This is the basics of Western civilization. You are responsible. But of course, in criminal code, sometimes we have a notion of incitement. You can be responsible for direct incitement, for example, if someone incites you to kill somebody, yes. But if this is defined in the criminal code, okay, this is the decision, democratic decision, of this and that country. I'm for being very, very careful as far as such measures are taken. Next question. I'm going to talk about respect. Your name? Uh, I'm Daniel Lockwood from KU Leuven, I do European studies. I think there's been a tremendous amount of disrespect on the part of uh, your generation for our generation. You can see that clearly in this conference. In the last discussion, there were four young women who were not able to say anything because too much time was taken up by the speakers. My I mean, question the, is, the is this, it or sorry, is it not? This panel, the previous panel, no. Also in this panel, I believe. Is it or is it not the fault of your generation that we have this current political crisis? Is it not the fault of your generation that we have this environmental crisis? Is it not the fault of your generation that we have this refugee crisis because it is not being talked about in a truthful and factual way? So my question for you is, look at Brussels, and look at the people who are the intellectual engine of the European Union, interns. We get paid nothing. We do all the work for your generation so that you can have these small-minded arguments. You don't think that makes us angry? You don't think that we want to have a say in the future of Europe that is actually our future? And we're the ones who have to live it? Look, obviously, do you know who I am? Let me just finish my question. Let me, you, let me just finish my question. Let me, no, no. I'll, I'll let you speak, but let me finish my question. With all due respect, and I mean respect, because our I'm generation always has worried. respect. When people start with due respect, then trouble comes. But go ahead. With all due respect, in the words of the introductory speech, why should we give a shit what your generation thinks when you clearly don't want to even ask or care what our generation believes or I'm thinks about? Here. I'm sorry, why are we sitting here? Look, uh, you know why I ask who I am? Because I wrote books. I, I, I always, I wrote books. I wrote, I uh, had television program, newspapers, and I say about your generation saying how the fact that, for instance, to be precise, we in, in very often in Italy, your generation are not paid. So I, I'm well known in Italy as someone who says and does, it's forbidden to have young people to work for free. I was also a stagiaire here, and we work for little money. But let me say something. Every generation has the right to come in and do and do you. But if your approach is we don't give a shit, you, don't, you won't go very far. And if, if you work with me, I won't hire you. So if you don't change your attitude and language, I don't think you'll go very far. To, to talk as a spokesman to your generation, I don't think it's very... As I said, I wanted to introduce, to have you talking from the very beginning, and we'll do so immediately from now, from now on, please. Thank you. 
Uh, my name is Naida. I'm from Sarajevo, from Bosnia and Herzegovina. I would just like to make a short remark. Um, I think we need to discuss media literacy. So a group of uncontrolled people online is not the same as people who know how to uh, evaluate the content online. So that's something we need to do. Maybe that's better said in um, learning democracy. It's learning how to evaluate the content online and then we can talk about uh, the world without censorship or what hate speech means. Um, what I wanted to ask is that maybe um, it's correct, it's uh, linked with the, with the previous uh, question is, um, what is the, um, okay, we talked about a lot about uh, primetime media and how uh, primetime media chooses the stories to be told. But why is some ignorance ignored? And why do some events get more coverage than the others? So, I mean, if you, we side out certain events and mark them as newsworthy. And who, I mean, who has the right to decide what's worthy and what's not worthy? That's my question. I mean, yeah, um, I can, I can, I hope I can answer that because I'm actually responsible for day-to-day -day news as well. Um, yes, it is a, it is slippery slope. Uh, it is a team of colleagues, yeah, who get, I mean, you all know that agency material comes in or the correspondents phone in or there is a, an appointment, an event, a date, the politician set and so on. And you have to then discern what is important, what is not important. Mostly the teams have a, a similar idea. Sometimes there are arguments. We had a huge argument now on Saturday. Do we report on a certain murder in Freiburg, yes or no, because it was committed by an um, immigrant, by an asylum seeker, sorry, an asylum seeker. Uh, how do we report it and so on? We have these discussions. And if you want, um, it is one of the most burning questions of journalism. Um, what goes to the front? When I'm abroad, I look at uh, Al Jazeera, Russia today, and I see a completely different mindset what is right or wrong or fault, I cannot tell you. I cannot tell you because it will be decided from day to day to day. All I can say is I cherish pluralism, I cherish other opinions, and I cherish uh, different perspectives, and I, I try to work for that, yeah. Uh, so would you say that journalists are those who set the criteria of what's important and what's not, or they're simply mirroring the elites and the major opinion? I would hope that journalists set the criteria. I know that this is wishful thinking. So th th this you. was, in my opinion, this was a very idealistic answer, but the question is actually interesting if we had enough time to discuss the mechanisms that rule inside today's media, perhaps we could speak about it uh, much longer. But I will try to cut it short. First of all, money. What sells that goes? Uh, because today's media have big, big problem with money. You know, the mechanism, the um, paper media don't sell, internet media have to learn how to earn money, and so on and so on. So apart from those reasons that perhaps play some role, uh, money is the biggest problem. Money also uh, makes some... Uh, dear and experienced journalists quit the job because media cannot afford them. So who's still in the media, less experienced journalists, younger journalists who sometimes even don't have any uh, tutor to, to learn from. So these are the problems of today's media. Zera, you have a question? My question might be a little irrelevant to what was has been dis uh, being discussed. Uh, I want to uh, ask about the narratives around uh, Turkey's EU membership. Uh, we know that the biggest argument for Brexit was that Turkey is becoming an uh, EU member, so like we should run, the alien culture is coming. Um, so, but that's not the reality. And we have been waiting for since, uh, since uh, 50 years, and nothing is happening. Um, so. What, what, how do you think uh, these narratives are 
uh, having an impact on Euroscepticism? I answer your question with a question. Do you think the current Turkey is, uh, as, is up to the standard of the European Union in terms of personal freedom, freedom of expression, and so on and so forth? Uh, well, it, it might not be, but uh, the, the popular discussion in Turkey, the argument is that why should we go into something that is already disintegrating? So uh, I think that that should be the... Uh, what point. is disintegrated? Uh, we, we have been discussing about you, EU, how it's, it's been disintegrating since two days, so... And I'm not getting it. The European Union is disintegrating. Yeah, I mean, we have the Brexit and... Uh, well, Brexit is one thing. They haven't gone yet, by the way. <laughs> it's one thing, and there are 27 left. Arguing, as you can see, but Poland is in, Hungary is in, Croatia is in. So why you say, I mean, why you say is disintegrated? Well, what are we discussing since two days? Then uh, aren't we discussing Euroscepticism? Skepticism. That's, that's, the rising, uh, that's the rising trend, isn't it? So you think that Europe is finished, and so it's not worth entering it? Uh, I, I, I don't think so, but that's what people think in Turkey. That's what what I do you say. think? Uh, well, it might be disintegrating. I don't have a like, very strict answer for that. But, uh, well, I don't, think, I don't think it's very positive. We are moving towards a very like, uh, uh, European Union, which is going to be integrated once again and have, uh, have the same power. Okay, can you pass the microphone on your right and you tell me, can you tell me please, now I, I want to know from you whether you think that Europe is a total disaster and we, what we built, uh, my generation and my, and my parents' generation, they, they built after the war is an utter and total disaster and shameful, shameful, thing, shameful things not to be worried, not to be proud of. Do you, or, do you think maybe there is something we could be proud of in modern day in Europe that we helped to build? I think most of the students seem to agree that the EU is the best model most that exists. Most of which students? This conference was based on the participation of 42 students. Uh, we participated in writing a manifesto for the purpose of the conference. I've noticed that every moderator, not just you, by the way, it's no one seems to realize that we're not the stars of the show, but we're participants and our opinion matters. So I, I would like to give the floor to somebody else. I think I've had my chance to speak, but uh, I can only say in my six years living here as an American living in, in Antwerp, um, the main problem that I see with Europe uh, as a whole is that the European Union couches itself in terms of inclus inclusiveness in member states where an inclusive society just does not exist and has never existed. For instance, in this country, there's uh, something called pillarization, where each of the political parties keeps to themselves. They don't, so the Catholics don't socialize with so uh, socialists, who don't socialize with liberals, who don't socialize with nationalists. They keep to themselves and only the elites the elder elites are the only ones who speak to each other, and that's exactly the same that you see in other countries around the world. And I don't, I don't think that is a good model for a regional uh, project. And I also believe that Europe is going very quickly in the direction of this American-style game of realpolitik. And it needs to stop now before, before we find ourselves back in 1913, 1914. And this just violence just all of a sudden erupts and we can't explain it. Well, I think the students can do a pretty good job of explaining what this world is leading to. And I think our worldview is much, much more accurate than the worldview I see represented by the speakers at this conference so far, with all due respect. <laughs> do you, how is the situation in Croatia, Antonio? about media expression and freedom Ooh. of expression and Okay, hello, my name is tolerance. Antonio. I'm coming from Croatia, uh, University of Josip Irajt Rosmer, studying business economics. Uh, well, when it comes to Croatia, media is changing from party to party. Well, who gets selected, the media is on their side. There's the one side and there's the other side. The capital 
is having the who has money uh, the corporations they're owning the media you cannot write anything against them so it's controlled all the time and the other side we have journalists that are writing each day something different they are not uh, they don't have experience for example just in politics one day they're ordered to write something about culture other day sport and then a little bit, okay, well, let's go to the parliament and write something about politics. So there is no, there is not, uh, uh, how can I say that? There is not enough quality people that can work as a journalist in Croatia. You have a, you answer my question, thank you. Do you have a question for our guest or your fellow students? Um, I will just uh, want to say, add something to the uh, colleague about um, media literacy. Uh, we should mo maybe more uh, starting about uh, formal and non-formal education be uh, because uh, our society is getting individually. So uh, if you want to know something, you have to learn by yourself. You, uh, there is no eth ethics or morality in schools anymore, and you are like supposed to be taught that at back at families. But families are not doing that, so you can be easily controlled by media or social networking. And for example, youth, they don't know what they, what they should think about what's going on in the world. Good. Uh, can I, can I just add something? Um, I was thinking, when do I feel European? It's not actually in Europe. <laughs> it's always when I'm outside of Europe. Then all of a sudden I have a very strong sense of what Europe is even what European values are, I get that sense. And I believe that um, this conference here, because you are all very sort of cosmopolitan, internationally linked up, you the young students, um, is going to be very, very helpful to define what is European. To be European is not necessarily uh, just to be a member of the European Union. And I believe that many people here are critical of the Union for good reasons, but I also am absolutely sure that um, what an anti-racist, anti-misogynist, we haven't talked about women very much, by the way, uh, anti-misogynist um, or anti-sexist, um, anti-fundamentalist um, agenda is vital, is vital for the further existence of, of Europe and of the European Union, and we should talk about that more. We should also talk about inclusion much more. Inclusion also means things that the elites have, um, have not talked much about for the last couple of decades, and that is including the poor. Yeah. We have been really sucked up by neoliberalism and by the, by the narrative of neoliberalism, you can get it if you want, and let's do away with those who can't keep up with the pace. So those are the narratives, you were asking about narratives, those were other narratives I would like to hear from you. Uh, can I ask you something, Alexandra? You're Polish? Yes. Uh, your generation in Poland, you get the news, in, you are informed through traditional media, television, radio, uh, printed media, social network, Facebook, like you personally mm -hmm. and, your, and people of your age, I'm interested, in Poland. Yeah, I think that's... And the same question is for you, of course. I mean, how people, their generation, get their information from in an important... So I think that most of young people do not read traditional media. Most of young people do not even have a t TV in home, so they do not buy television as a product in the shop. So uh, most of them are looking for information in internet, inter alia social media. So uh, when it comes also to quality of journalism, especially internet one, I used to work for um, one of the um, portals, the informative one. So I uh, just used to know how the information are selected and presented. So I think that unluckily most of young people do not search for further information. Whatever um, they think, just to make some research, uh, both right and left side. 
So I think that the biggest problem is that they're reading just very short communications. So there is such saying, too long, too long didn't read. So they are reading very short information, do not check the facts, and building on this basis their way of perceiving the world and politics. So I think that's the biggest problem about it. More or less, I would agree. Of course, this is true that uh, young people in Poland usually don't watch television. Uh, very rarely they listen to, to the radio and mostly they use the internet. But on one issue I would disagree, or at least to an extent, which is um, their uh, ability to check facts. Because there are many bloggers, young bloggers in Poland, who in fact, do the work that journalists should do. Because they dig deep into the data. They dig deep into government files, if they can. And if they can't, they even sue the government to reveal the data that the government doesn't want to reveal. And they do what, in fact, those media, who are short of money, as I said, should do. So they are really very good at that. Um. Can I um, contribute somehow? Yes. yes. Go ahead. Well, in 1991, I crossed the um, Greek Albanian borders illegally with my parents. And we did that because we didn't have much food. So we didn't escape a war, but we escaped poverty, which was violence. When we arrived at the borders, we asked from the soldiers, the Greek soldiers, to let us in. And they let us in, just like that. They weren't um, really much... Um, connected to, the, to aliens, like who are these aliens? They didn't know. There wasn't immigration back then. They didn't expect no one from Albania, as no one has ever go, go, go there from a long time. So these people gave me the opportunity from an alien to become an us, uh, to the us, to the community, and they integrated me in. And today I have the chance of being in Amsterdam, studying there and confronting you. So I would really like us to think that uh, economic reasons, it's a violence in itself and it's not only war. If we don't have food, it's violence. Can I, we have five more minutes. I have a question. I have, I a, have a comment, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Woman participation and everything. Um, uh, we were talking about, you said how journalists are those who need to do fact checking. I would completely disagree on that because to not to, not to evaluate the content of what you're reading is n complete nonsense in 21st century. So not only journalists, but everyone, every single, uh, single one of us, if we use social networks, we're media. We're distributing and uh, like uh, sharing information any further. We're not, perhaps not journalists, but we are media. And therefore, journalists are not the only one who need to. Um, new, do the fact checking. So the young people in Poland, it's not actually journalists' fault. They're not well informed. Information literacy, media literacy, digital literacy, you can call it whatever you want. But you have the, this whole wide area in front of you, the, the wide, uh, the internet, which is the informations are there. You need to look for it and not to blame others when you do something which is um, based on those often false informations because that's what brought this here at the first place. So that's my point, thank you. You are from the Czech Republic. Hi, I'm Marketa from Czech Republic. And I, ha I have a question. Uh, you mentioned a lot that uh, it's uh, made journalist who should uh, do fact checking individuals, but I have my personal experience. I work for a small group. Uh, we are like uh, five or six persons in Czech Republic and we do fact checking every week and we fact check about uh, 80 articles. And yeah, we, uh, we uh, find that something isn't true and we have some proof, but nobody r really cares about it. You know that, um, and my question is, if it's work just for journalists and NGOs, who should do that, or also for governments, or European Union, because I know that the uh, European Union has this uh, group called East.com, but nobody really knows that it really exists. 
So it's a like general question. It is simply very difficult to answer because that's what we, the established media journalists, ask themselves every day. We are uncovering, we are doing a lot of, my company did a lot of reporting and researching in doping scandal in Russia, a lot, spent a lot of money, months and months of research, right? And we think, okay, wow, this is going to have an effect and it, the effect is not the one we wish for. So um, that is the limit. I think that's the limit of journalism and the only possible outcome is that people take journalism and information gathering more seriously. And I like very much what you said. It's about the uh, literacy, the literacy of the general audience as well, of the users. We, are, we cannot walk on water, yeah? Uh, we, we also need the help of, of the audience to distribute and then make a change. I, I always believe journalism is there to make a change. No, it doesn't, not often enough, right? So, um, so carry on doing it, your 80 articles every week, and don't despair, it's Sisyphos work. Can I have a final question? If you want to answer, any of you, I'd be happy. Quick uh, questions. What you just said, coming from Albania, you are, you are coming into a land, a part of the world that you consider safer, probably wealthier, probably a better life for your family when your family brought you over. I was five. Yes. Yes. Your, when I say, when your family brought you over, I worked it out. You came in 92, I worked out that you must have been a child. Uh, why? Why? Um, even from you, is there a new generation, apart from what we failed in many ways. I know we did fail in many ways, but something else we did well. We were very lucky. My, I was born in 56, and my generation lived through from two, the most amazing years of freedom, of travel, of sharing. And now the problems are there, economic, and we are not, we can't cope with it. Maybe we are here together trying to talk to you because we, we, we find it so difficult. Why? That's my question. Why? I don't hear from you or very rarely, not only today, the fact that people from out southern Mediterranean, Turkey, Albania, uh, they come to Europe because it's still is a safer place, it's a better place, and, and we are surrounded by liberal governments. Turkey is going the way it's going, Russia is going the way it's going, the world is going, and, and people are flocking to Europe because they see as a all together, with all our mistakes, our, a better place, and why we concentrate only and we started to hate each other and talk of Europe as it was a failure. I will bring away what you say. Euro the European Union is disintegrated. It is not. I why don't, don't you all, not one said, you know, why don't you celebrate that the fact we are living peacefully, you can say whatever you want in a theater, in Brussels, live stream. No one brought that up. Mm. Democracy, freedom is not a process that is uh, done forever. We, were, we want more democracy, more freedom, negotiate it again and again until, yes, in a lifetime. Okay. So, may yeah. I answer your question? Yes. So may I answer? I, Sorry, uh, because I, I'm included in the, yes. in the group of the people who can answer, I hope, yes? So it's very naive to think, it's very naive to think that immigrants, and I very strongly divide the group into immigrants and refugees. These are not the same. Immigrants come here to Europe because of European values and so on and all, those, all this blah, blah, blah that we've been doing here. They come for two things, welfare and money. And perhaps sometimes work, but very rarely. And that's all. So today was blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so you travel from Poland to join a blah, blah, blah. But I was one of very few people who didn't do this. Of course. <laughs> Please. Uh, yeah. Um, what you just said was going through my mind for you know, this whole discussion, that we really don't realize how lucky we are that we can s be here in the EU and just talk um, about these issues freely. I mean, I, I don't like using personal examples, but I grew up in Russia, in a country where journalists were killed for their beliefs, where uh, 
people I know, politicians were killed for their beliefs even last year in front of the, in front of the Kremlin. Um, and what you just said, that people just moved to the EU just for welfare. I know many Russians, open-minded Russians, who moved to the EU because the EU gives them a safe space to express their opinions. You know, you have the uh, latest example, Alia Kashin, um, a brilliant journalist, moved to London because he can only do his work from the EU. And I think it's something we really, really need to st stress how lucky we are that, that it, at, in the EU we can say the things we want to say. Thank you. I, I can't, Lukas, I can't let it stand that you say people come to Europe, what, for welfare and maybe work. I find that so shameful, so what, racist, I don't know. I, I find it absolutely disgusting because we've been through this. I lived for a long time in the Ruhr region, Polish immigrants formed the culture there, right? They did not come for German values, but they came to have a better life, and a better life actually includes values. It's not just about bread and butter. And um, I just find it shameful what you just I said. I know, reality bites. Sleep on. You are disgusting. Okay, yeah. no, I want to, I want to, you have the last word, whatever it is, I leave that to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> feel special now. Um, yeah, I just wanted to point out, so I, I guess I'm in a similar situation. I was born in Algeria, and my parents are Algerians, my grandparents are Algerians, so my whole family is Algerian. I grew up in Spain, though. Um, people do come to Europe uh, looking for a better life, and looking for a uh, space where they can fulfill their dreams. Now, an income, that, an income is part of that dream. They need, that. they need food, they need security, they need welfare, they need uh, education, they need that money. I don't think there's people um, trying to make money that come to uh, Europe just looking for that money. That, that, that is not a, the profile of most people. And if there is someone that is coming to Europe because of the wealth of Europe, just, just remember that that wealth was stolen once from the South. That the, the you know, the, the, the gold you see in the room came from Africa, not Poland. So that, that, that wealth is, is coming from somewhere. But even with that, with that exception, I'm telling you, because I was born in a, in a family like that, people don't come for money. If they can make money at their, at their place, they'll do it. They come here for a better living. They want to fulfill their dreams, they, they want to have a better life. That's, that's all most people look for. Sorry, but sorry, but you said that why we're critical. We're critical because justice, freedom, democracy is a never-ended process, and if we do, if we're not critical, we will end up with more people like Lucas. And we like that. Thank you. The blah blah is over. Have lunch. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>